fun-loving, dearborn native Patricia Jernigan has always been blessed to have the support of her parents. She was just always outgoing. She loved to tell jokes and be funny, you know. Everybody loved Patricia. She came out of a good Christian home, had a good childhood, was a loving daughter. In addition to her close-knit family, wherever Patricia is, her best friend LaToya is never too far away. They grew up together. LaToya spent a lot of time in our home. You see one, you will see the other. And they loved each other. So when Patricia has a baby at 17, she has no shortage of help. It's not easy having a child at such a young age. So Trish relied on LaToya a lot to be there as her best friend. Patricia was so young, she didn't have a job. She wasn't finished with school. So we took care of the baby and did, you know, everything necessary for him to provide and give him care. It's really tough being a very young single mother, but Patricia was fortunate. She had the support of her family and LaToya, and so in many ways, Patricia now was able to do those things that a lot of single young mothers are not able to accomplish. With support from those closest to her, the young mother is able to graduate high school and pursue her true passion, cooking. Patricia put herself through culinary school, had uh, progressed as a normal adult would into their career, and had strong ambitions for her adulthood and for her son. A woman of strong faith, whenever Sunday rolls around, she's ready to praise. And it's at church where she first lays eyes on an attractive older man, 31-year-old Terrell Smith. She wasn't going to church looking for anybody. She was going to worship. And he first noticed her. He seemed like a nice guy. He was polite and friendly and dressed clean. The young mother is intrigued by the charming new churchgoer, even when she sees a clear sign he's no angel. Terrell was wearing an ankle monitor, and Patricia noticed. Ankle tether in tow, the ex-con is only allowed to go to work, attend church, and has a strict curfew. But that doesn't stop him from pursuing Patricia. It was mostly church. They see each other and then talking on the phone. When she was like, well, Mommy, you know, well, he's nice, and we pray together. And to her surprise, he's very open about what got him locked up, a run-in with an old flame. Terrell told her that it was a miscommunication, that there was an argument with his ex-girlfriend. Basically, he had went to her place of employment, got in her car, carjacked her using a weapon, and there was a report of kidnapping in there as well. He explains that even though he has sinned, he's a different person now. Patricia was accepting of him, you know, because she felt he deserved a fair chance, and she felt as though he knew the Lord. Patricia sees Terrell as a hard worker, who is desperate to leave his convict past behind. When she first met him, he was out trying to find a job, which was hard for him because there was not many places that were felon friendly. Patricia was very, very strong in her faith, and she really believed, judge not, lest ye be judged. She was also looking for a man who perhaps would not only be a partner to her, but be a father to her son. And Patricia is over the moon when she brings her son to Terrell's home for the first time. And upon meeting, they have an instant father-son bond. Pretty soon, the three of them are inseparable. She wanted to be a family with him. She wanted to be a wife. So when he come along, he just put the icing on top of the cake. Patricia and Terrell's relationship progressed pretty quickly. They had met in December, and within a couple of months, they had moved in together and started an exclusive dating relationship. But when Patricia tells her best friend LaToya about her new boyfriend, right away, she is worried her girl is moving too fast with a shady guy. She didn't have a good feeling on their relationship. The information Patricia gave her about Terrell was unsettling. She had got a bad vibe as far as Terrell's personality and his demeanor. From the moment Patricia told her best friend LaToya about Terrell, she never had the desire to meet him. He was wearing an ankle bracelet. He was a convicted felon. She told Patricia straight out, if that's the man you want, then you go be with him. And soon, Patricia's family starts to share LaToya's doubts about Terrell. After about six, seven months into the relationship, I noticed a change. 
the friends that she used to socialize with, she didn't talk to anymore. He made her block Latoya on the phone and stop calling her. And when I would ask to see the baby, he would intervene and say, no, I couldn't. He was her everything. She stopped calling, stopped coming around. You know, Christmas and holidays, she wasn't coming around. As Patricia became more and more isolated, Terrell would often keep tabs on Patricia, checking her phone, checking text messages, phone calls, uh, monitoring her social media, and controlling what she says and who she talks to. Patricia sensed that her loved ones really did disapprove of Terrell. She began to isolate herself from them. So Terrell became her only source of support, her anchor, the only person that she felt now believed in her. It's not long before those closest to her begin to fear the worst. Latoya calls one day and she says, I'm scared for Patricia and the baby. Terrell is just taking over. We're not friends anymore. He's controlling her. She even confronts Patricia directly. Right. Patricia would always have the rebuttal for Latoya that Terrell was a man of God, he was a man of his faith, and that he could do no wrong. Latoya is unconvinced. And as it turns out, her instincts are dead on. Terrell is no longer acting like the reform center he claimed to be. He rules the household with an iron fist. And his power even extends to the bedroom. After he had gained control over Patricia, he had brought up the idea for him and Patricia to participate in threesomes. And because it satisfied him, Patricia had participated but would feel degraded. I think Patricia had a hard time with these threesomes. I think that she was ashamed about it. And it was something that she did in the dark that she never wanted to come to light. When you manipulate a person, you control them like a puppet. And she had her mind. She had fallen to some things she never would have dreamed of. And it, it just broke my heart because she turned into somebody I didn't even know. And after some time, the ex-con grows bored with their regular threesomes. He now has his eye on a bigger prize, his girl's best friend, Latoya. He's intrigued by their close relationship even though he has never met her in person. Terrell's impression of Patricia and LaToya's relationship was not only that it was a strong friendship, but he also believed that there was a sexual relationship as well. And he suddenly became fixated on her. He went to her Facebook page, scrolled through her pictures, learned about her. And I think that Terrell made up this whole relationship between two best friends because he was delusional. Patricia finally puts her foot down. She insists that LaToya is the one person that's off limits. She did not want her involved. She did not want that part of her life to be exposed. So she completely stood up to him and told him, no, not this time. And Terrell did not take that well at all. This infuriated Terrell to the point where he became obsessed with getting LaToya at any means possible. The determined boyfriend refuses to give up. So instead of dropping the subject, he grabs Patricia's cell phone one evening and starts texting LaToya. Terrell would pretend to be Patricia and explain that she was sexually attracted to her. And LaToya would often respond with goodbye, Terrell, knowing that it was him. LaToya knew that her friend would never speak that way. She knew the way she texted, and she wasn't having it. When LaToya later confronts her best friend about the texting, an embarrassed Patricia agrees that from now on, they need to have a code when they text each other. So she went on and told her friend, you know what, this is what we're gonna do. From now on, you'll know when I'm texting you because I'm gonna lead off with a question. When I text you, if there's a question in front, it's me. If not, it's Terrell. Patricia was utterly and totally dominated by this man. And some single moms who don't have many options may feel that someone who perhaps has the answer, they have to go along with whatever that person may say in order to continue to get their affection. 23-year-old Patricia Jernigan is completely under the spell of her ex-con boyfriend, Terrell Smith. You're gonna send her a text, tell her you And when he demands she help him kidnap her best friend, Latoya, so he can rape her. She reluctantly agrees to make her man's brutal dream a reality. Me, you and Latoya, we gonna do this, whether you like it or not. 
For Patricia to go along with this plot really speaks to the fact that she probably wasn't even herself anymore. She had been beaten down so much that she was willing to do something yeah. that was such an utterly and complete betrayal to the woman who had helped her most of her life. No, I can't. I can't. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Send a text. All right. So Terrell's plan was to kidnap Latoya at gunpoint. And even though Patricia was going along with this, she did have one request. Patricia convinced Terrell that they could use a toy gun so that she wouldn't actually be shot in this whole scheme. He agrees, but he makes her come with him to a store to buy the fake weapon. Then a few days later, the couple puts their vile plan into action. Patricia had reached out to LaToya via text message using their code words and had expressed that she had broken up with Terrell and that she was pregnant with his baby, which was a lie, and that she wanted to go out together. Since Terrell had entered the picture, they hadn't been close anymore. So Patricia had to wean her way back in, come up with all these different lies, and allow LaToya to feel sorry for her in order to get back into her good graces. LaToya agrees to meet her friend. They make a date to have dinner, and Patricia tells her that she'll head over shortly to pick her up. Patricia drove to LaToya's house and dropped Terrell off at the corner of LaToya's street. LaToya had come out of her home and had gotten into the front passenger side of Patricia's car. Patricia asked LaToya to look up directions to a restaurant on her phone. And while LaToya was looking down, Terrell shows up at the passenger side door with the toy gun that looked completely real and scared the hell out of LaToya. In the back. The frightened woman quickly realizes she's been betrayed by her friend. Really, Trish? And Patricia was so ashamed, so embarrassed, she couldn't make eye contact with her. She looked forward and never even looked at her. In the back. I think it all hit her right then and there. Look what I have done. Afraid for her life, LaToya makes a run for it. LaToya exited the rear and proceeded to start running home screaming for help. Terrell chased her, pistol whipped her, and carried her back to the car. All the while, Patricia sits in the car, completely numb. Things were out of her control at that moment. She really didn't know what Terrell was gonna do. So she just sat quietly and prayed that she didn't get hurt. Terrell forced her into the trunk, snatched her phone out of her hand, and proceeded to speed off towards the freeway. Trapped, LaToya claws and cries for help. She was claustrophobic, she's screaming and hollering, and Patricia does what? She turns the music up just to tune LaToya out. She had to feel bad about what was going on, but at the same time, she was complying with the man she loved. When Patricia heard LaToya in the trunk screaming and yelling for her life and that she felt that she could do absolutely nothing while this horrific episode was unfolding, and perhaps even though she wasn't the person that was locked in the trunk, psychologically, she was locked in the trunk of her mind. Not about to give up, LaToya searches for a way out. She realized that there was a glow-in-the-dark latch trunk release in the car. She pulled it and heard a loud pop. LaToya peeks through the opening and quickly realizes they're on the freeway, going more than 60 miles per hour with cars on either side. LaToya decided to make the jump, regardless of the oncoming traffic. She knew that if she was going to die, she was going to die at her own hands and not at the hands of Terrell. So she made a split decision to jump out onto the road. Unbeknownst to the couple, a terrified LaToya uses every ounce of faith and strength that she has and leaps from the trunk. She launches onto the expressway, and she continued to roll down the center turn lane with oncoming traffic approaching her. Get in the way! LaToya rolls onto the shoulder of I-94, a bloodied mess. She lies there on the side of the freeway, motionless. They were stunned. They couldn't believe it. Terrell was so upset, he got off at the very next exit, circled back around to where LaToya made the jump, but she was already gone. Terrell is furious that his plan has gone off the rails, and he blames his girl for LaToya's escape. 
Unsure of their next move, Patricia throws the gun out of the window, and the couple proceeds home to figure out a plan. When Patricia discovered, along with Terrell, that Latoya had actually gotten out of that trunk, I have to believe that Patricia felt, oh, good, my friend got away. No matter what the repercussions to me or to Terrell, she got away. She's alive. Thank goodness. Before Terrell was able to circle back, Latoya had come to and ran alongside the highway ramp in an attempt to flag someone down. Latoya was able to get into this car of this person who saw her running up the ramp where she was taken to a gas station where there happened to be two Detroit police officers. They didn't know if she was crazy, who she was, what was going on. She's frantic, she's bloody, but they immediately call an ambulance to assist her. She was treated and miraculously her injuries were minor in comparison to what they could have been. She escaped with bumps and bruises it could have been so much worse for her. And at the hospital, she tells police about the nightmare she just survived. She was able to get the names of Patricia Jernigan and Terrell Smith, her best friend and her best friend's boyfriend. The next day, investigators track down the kidnappers. Patricia and Terrell went along with their lives just as if nothing had happened and that there would be no consequences at all. They felt everything was OK. Terrell was driving to pick up Patricia from her place of employment. From there, both Patricia and Terrell were apprehended in the parking lot. Police haul Patricia and her man in for questioning, but they are both tight-lipped. Terrell was very reluctant to talk. He attempted to control the interview. He didn't disclose a lot of information. However, Patricia was more forthcoming and told us that this whole plan was Terrell's idea and that she was forced to go along with it. You knew that it was a toy gun and she wasn't really going to get hurt, but it was just going to scare her. But you knew. Yeah. OK. When officers search Terrell's vehicle, they find Latoya's fingerprints on the inside trunk latch, further confirming Latoya's account of the incident. They also uncover surveillance video from the store, which shows them buying the toy gun. It is all police need to charge the pair for the incident. The news of what their daughter has done is too much for Patricia's parents to bear. He manipulated her, he threatened her. Cause ain't no way in the, in the hell Patricia would have did something like that. It's not in her character. It just hurt so bad because that's my baby. And she had fallen so hard into things that was so far beneath her. The evidence against the two of them is so overwhelming that Patricia comes to an agreement with prosecutors and pleads guilty to armed robbery and unlawful imprisonment. Patricia agreed to a plea deal and in turn ultimately testified against Terrell and was given a sentence of five to 15 years. Terrell, on the other hand, decides to take his chances in court. Throughout the trial, Terrell maintained his innocence. He projected himself to be a great boyfriend, a great father figure, and a man of God in the name of Jesus, so he declared. But the jury is unimpressed with the 31-year-old's performance, and Terrell is found guilty of torture, kidnapping, second-degree criminal sexual conduct, armed robbery, and unlawful imprisonment. And as a repeat offender, per Michigan law, he is sentenced to a range of 42 to 65 years in prison. A girl looking for a good guy, and what better place to find him but in a church. In the church of God, she found the devil. She did a criminal activity, but she was led into that. And had she been strong enough and seeked help, it never would have led up to that crime. While serving her sentence, Patricia has been able to maintain her relationship with a higher power. She's into the ministry at the facility that she at now, and uh, everything gonna work all right. Laura's in her corner. Patricia started off as this you know, really good girl. I mean, church going, very strong in her faith, but ended up meeting this wolf in sheep's clothing who had professed he was a God-fearing person, but in fact, was still the sinner he originally was, and that ended up bringing Patricia down in sin herself. And in Michigan, when a single mother meets a good-looking ex-con, 
he turns her against her most loyal friend. LaCarla McCarty gave up everything that was most precious to her for a chance at true love. Growing up in rural Louisiana, LaCarla McCarty knows what it's like to struggle. When LaCarla was three years old, her father had passed away. So she was raised by her mother and her grandmother, but they were always strapped financially. She drops out of high school in the 11th grade to help support her family. Having to take on these responsibilities at such a young age really forced her to grow up much quicker than she should have. And it certainly took away a lot of her own needs that she may have had in order to mature. For the next 15 years, she bounces from job to job and in and out of relationships. Soon, she's raising three little ones, ages 10, 8, and 4, all on her own. By her 30s, LaCarla moves to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to be near her family. So LaCarla's mother fell ill, and her older brother lived in Grand Rapids. He moved her mother to be closer to him, and LaCarla followed. The struggling mom lives in a modest house and focuses all her attention on maintaining a decent life for her children. Her kids were her world. So LaCarla was working a bunch of odds and ends jobs, including car detailing and working at a restaurant, anything to put food on the table. She put the needs of her children before her own needs, which in effect made her a very needy person. And things get worse when a pinched disc in her lower back forces her to quit her jobs and go on disability. She was scraping by and she has to live off this fixed income. It makes it even harder for her to survive. Single moms have it hard. It can be tough with one, but when you have two or three and you're trying to make it, you have to make everything happen. She was lonely. She didn't have a man, a boyfriend, a fiance. She was out in the world pretty much by herself. So she's kind of spiraling into this further loneliness and depression. The only light in LaCarla's life comes from the time she spends with a tight-knit group of women at the local church. It was about three or four of them that were friends. They kind of called themselves sisters. They had been friends for years. And that helped her to have a release from the struggles in her life. She could commune with fellow Christians. One Sunday, her girlfriend, Takesha Moore, brings her new husband along, 41-year-old Andrew Neal. And even though he's forbidden fruit, LaCarla finds herself drawn to the handsome construction worker. When LaCarla saw Andrew, she was like, geez, this guy looks good. He is fine. Like, how did Takesha get him? She was definitely a little envious. He pours it on thick when his wife isn't looking, and LaCarla soaks up every drop. Andrew liked to be in charge. He liked to be in control. LaCarla was a person who could be manipulated. And Andrew, he saw that. Andrew made the moves on LaCarla and they started meeting in secret. Before long, the two spend every moment they can together. After putting the needs of her family before her own, really not taking care of herself, uh, LaCarla just didn't really care that this man was married. Now it was her time. It was about herself. Andrew is up front and tells her he spent time behind bars. He actually did 10 years in prison. But he neglects to get into detail about what landed him there. He had been previously incarcerated for armed robbery, robbed a bank and put a shotgun to someone's head and made him get in the closet. I mean, he told me all of that. He hadn't been out that long, i say maybe a year or two, but he was a charmer. Andrew was able to manipulate women. He's quick to tell her that he found redemption at church and is even studying to become a deacon. I believe that he genuinely wanted to do well. He wanted to put his past behind him. Believing everyone deserves a second chance and drawn by her desires, LaCarla begins an affair with her girlfriend's husband. Not a lot of men were coming her way. So when she saw Andrew and he showed her a little bit of attention, she jumped at the chance to be with him. Within weeks, the two are madly in love and Andrew leaves his wife, stops going to church and moves in with LaCarla and her kids. Everybody referred to him as a family. That was their family. It was like they're together. 
She was looking for someone to take care of her, someone to take care of her children. So even though she was at risk of losing her friendship with her friend, at this point, she didn't care because he was worth it. The 35-year-old single mom is grateful to have a man like Andrew in her life. She sees him as the man of her dreams, but he will soon turn into her worst nightmare. After eight months together, things between the once happy couple start to fall apart. He never divorced his wife. He was really just like a live-in boyfriend. And to make matters worse, Andrew suddenly loses his construction job and has to go on unemployment. He did have some physical problems of blood clots in his legs, and he was laid off. She's already on disability. Now he's on unemployment. Money was getting tighter and tighter. They're in bad financial straits. Just general bills, I think, with raising kids and electricity and water, and things were piling up. Rent money was coming due. And LaCarla is really worried that she's going to be put out on the street with her kid. Andrew assures his girl that he's willing to do whatever it takes to dig them out of this hole. When you're in a place of desperation, you're not thinking. You're in survival mode. Then one fall evening, the ex-con has an idea. Andrew told her that he knew how to get money. He knew a person that would have money. Then he kind of throws out there, I know what he said I can kill for $10,000. LaCarla's shocked that Andrew would talk about killing someone, but can't help being curious to know more. And that's when LaCarla asked him, well, who are you going to off? He explains that he's friends with a church member, 35-year-old Mashonda Griffin, who lives just five miles away in Wyoming, Michigan. Mashonda was this wonderful, educated, very talented young lady. She was single, never married, and she was a whiz at finance. She's the treasurer of the church. She worked for a mortgage company, and she had uh, this cancer foundation. LaCarla knew Mashonda in passing. She'd seen her at church, but she really didn't know her personally. The ex-con says he's borrowed money from her before and is certain he'll be able to get 10 grand from her. The whole idea was that, hey, she's maybe get $10,000. I mean, she's the church treasurer. She's going to have a big amount of money. Andrew says that because Mashonda lives alone and is very trusting, she's the perfect target. But since she'll be able to identify him, he'll have no choice. He has to kill her. Well, I'm just going to have to do what I have to do. LaCarla isn't quite sure if her man is serious. She didn't believe him. She thought maybe he was talking crazy because they were strapped for cash. She heard the words, but she didn't really process them. I really do believe she just kind of buried her head in the sand. And as long as she didn't acknowledge what was going on, she wasn't responsible for any of it. Three days later, around 9 p.m., Andrew sets his plan in action. While her children sleep, he asks LaCarla to drive him over to Mashonda's home, and she obeys him without question. Whether it be she was lovesick, whether she just didn't want to lose a man, she kind of put her normal thought process to the side. I think when people get put in situations where they're not comfortable, they become desperate, and desperate people do desperate things. As the car pulls up to Mashonda's house, Andrew gets out. LaCarla heads home and tries not to think about what her boyfriend is about to do. It seems to me that LaCarla was just having a complete break from reality. She felt that she was separated from this, but by driving him to Mashonda's home, she now became an accomplice, whether she wanted to admit that or not. Andrew takes a deep breath and knocks on Mashonda's door. She answered the door. She knew him. We don't have any reason to believe she was afraid of him uh, and allowed Andrew into the house. Once inside, he wastes no time. He asks the church treasurer if he can borrow more money. But when Mashonda declines, the ex-con decides it's now or never. When she turns her back, he grabs one of her scarves and slowly comes up behind her. surprises her and gets, you know, once you get somebody's windpipe, they can't make a loud noise. She's not going to be able to yell with the ligature around her neck. And he strangled her with it. And that wasn't good enough for Andrew. He didn't think she was dead. So he put a pillow over her face and smothered her to finish her off. 
He leaves her lifeless body on the floor of her bedroom and then frantically searches her house. I think the whole idea was she was the treasurer, so he probably thought she's got some sort of hiding place where she keeps the church money. He ransacked her place. He looked in every place for this cash. But there are no hidden stacks of money. All he's able to scrounge up is a purse full of credit cards. He obviously didn't get the things that he wanted, like money. The only thing he took was her ATM card. And the way she was killed, it was cold and heartless, without any thought. Determined not to come home empty-handed, he steals his victim's car and then drives to various ATMs around town. Andrew had apparently decided to attempt to use her debit card to, to retrieve funds from the bank. He never got any money, though. He never got the pen. Disappointed, Andrew finally heads back home around 2 in the morning. He parks Mashonda's car a few blocks away, walks to LaCarla's house, and wakes her up. He admits that he did the deed, but didn't get the payout he was hoping for. LaCarla's mind was racing. She feels protective over Andrew. This is the first guy that is willing to take on all of her baggage. But she also has mixed feelings because this is a murder. And he says, hey, I have these credit cards. I'm going to fill up our tanks with gas. And LaCarla doesn't ask any questions. She knows their vehicles are on empty and agrees to help him. So that speaks to her naivete. That speaks to her willingness to be manipulated or even her need to have a man in her life. While her children sleep, the two head out in their own cars. She's trying to survive, so they go to the gas station. She knew they needed gas. She really didn't care where the cars came from. With their tanks now full, they return home. But their late night excursion is not over. Back at the house, Andrew tells his girl where to pick him up and takes off on foot to deal with Mashonda's car. Two, three o'clock in the morning, Andrew goes and dumps the car by the cemetery. He does something to dismantle it to, to make it appear abandoned and then leaves it. LaCarla doesn't say a word as she collects him near the graveyard and drives them home. As the sun rises, LaCarla focuses on making her kids lunches for the day. But before she can fully process the trouble they're in, Andrew bluntly informs her that he's going to Detroit, about two hours east, to see his family for the day. And he gives LaCarla the clothes he wore during the crime. He asked LaCarla to dump his clothes and uh, get rid of them. She had questions about whether she should do it or not, but because of her loyalty to him, she listens to him. She got rid of the clothes, she put them in a dumpster behind a pizza place. This was perhaps the perfect opportunity for LaCarla to say, wait a minute, I think I need to go to the police here. She just did not want to lose that relationship. When Andrew returns later, his anxiety level starts to redline. No one has discovered Mashonda's body yet. He wanted her phone. And he was getting a little anxious, and he was pacing the floor, just waiting to hear something on the news. But the fact that she wasn't located was concerning to him. The next day, he just can't take it anymore the ex-con boldly returns to the scene of the crime. So Andrew arrives at Mashonda's house and peeks in the window and sees that she was still dead. So he goes to a neighbor, asks for a phone to call the police. When investigators arrive, Andrew is waiting for them. He thinks in his head, if he discovers the body, he will be the least likely suspect. The police find Mashonda's lifeless body in the bedroom, surrounded by a chaotic crime scene. They immediately look to Andrew for answers, but he's ready with a story. He said he was trying to call her. He was try trying to borrow some money from her. Uh, she wasn't responding, so he just went over there to see if there was anything wrong. Detectives ask him a few questions about himself. The ex-con is quick to say he's a deacon at his church and he has a family he looks after. Andrew gave us her information. Just as somebody, I think he's, he lived with her. He was giving us his living situation. Not realizing they're staring at Mashonda's killer, police allow Andrew to leave. Even when Mashonda's car is located at the cemetery, it doesn't give them any clues to her killer. But when detectives dig deeper, they discover that someone tried to use her ATM cards in the early morning hours after her death. The bank surveillance depicted a black male with a hoodie on his head. 
the icing on the cake, they saw Mashonda's car right in back of him. But the real kicker is when investigators uncover charges on her card from a gas station that night. And when they pull those security tapes, they can't believe their eyes. We watched the Carla and Andrew pull up their cars and three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, fill up both their vehicles. So we knew that if they were involved, we didn't know how deep a Carla went. Four days after the murder, police bring them both in for questioning. Filled with guilt, Andrew confesses to the murder of Mashonda Griffin. Yet he refuses to turn on his girl. He was already content with going back to prison, but he was really trying to protect La, La Carla. He says, I don't want her involved in this at all. When it's La Carla's turn, she plays dumb, until police show her photos of the surveillance video they have, and she confesses. She broke down, hysterically crying, worrying about her freedom, worrying about her kids. She knew that the jig was up. She knew that she had to see the reality that she was in deep trouble, and now she had to pay the price. Andrew Neal and LaCarla McCarty are arrested and charged with the first-degree felony murder of Mashonda Griffin. If you knowingly help somebody commit a crime, you can be charged just as the principal. Andrew pleads guilty and is sentenced to life without parole. That spring, La Carla takes her chances in court. Four days later, she is found guilty and also sentenced to life without parole. 